Welcome everybody to the stories from the files of the Scottsdale Police Department. My name is Bruce Wall. I'm with the Citizen Service Department and I'm Scottsdale's unofficial historical storyteller. And I've enjoyed doing the research and finding out about this and then sharing these stories with all of you. So now I have to channel my brother for a second. <clears throat> the following program contains subject matter that may be inappropriate for younger viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. This presentation wouldn't have been possible without the cooperation and help and support of both Don Logan and retired detective Tom Van Meter. They gave me an uh, incalculable amount of information that really was wonderful. And I just want to tip my hat to them and say thank you to both of them. Our first story is called An Explosive Day in Scottsdale. This picture will make a lot more sense in just a minute. We're going to go back to the year 2004. Scottsdale was about 10% smaller in population, but it was almost the same size geographically as it is today in 2020. The mayor in 2004 was Mary Manross. She's the mayor that was before Jim Lane, our current mayor. And to give you a little bit of the backstory, Don Logan was born and raised in South Phoenix, and he graduated from Arizona State University. Go Sun Devils! He was hired as a traffic engineering technician with the city of Scottsdale in 1979, and he rose to the ranks as a parking violation hearing officer, manager of the one-stop shop in development services. He became the chief of staff for city manager Dick Bowers and worked a, a lot with Mayor Herb Drinkwater. Approximately 1999, he was named to a new position, the Director of Diversity and Dialogue, and reported directly to the city manager. Now, pose from Don, the other character in this story, or characters, are Dennis and Daniel Mahon, twin brothers who grew up in Illinois. Um, they, interestingly, uh, Dennis read a book, uh, White Supremacist Manifesto, and this Book while he was an airline mechanic, really, he, he really spoke to him. And he realized that he was very much believing in the white supremacist belief in ideology. By the end of the 70s, Dennis had joined the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. And then for work, he had to move to Kansas City, Missouri, and he found that there was no chapter over there, so he founded the Missouri White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. But by 1990, he became become disenchanted by the Ku Klux Klan, not because they were too radical, but because they weren't radical enough. So he found instead a, a man named Tom Metzger, who had started a group called the White Aryan Resistance, or WAR. And he advocated a lot of lone wolf attacks on on the US government. And it was more in keeping with that book that he had read. And one of the people who subscribed to this, one of his followers, was Timothy McVeigh. And he and Terry Nichols perpetrated the Oklahoma City bombing of the Alfred Primora Federal Building that killed 168 people on April 19, 1995. In one witness account, the person in the passenger seat of when McVeigh drove the truck to the building, described someone that exactly matched Dennis Mahone. But Dennis was able to prove he wasn't there at that time. But he was always put on a watch list after that. Fast forward to about the year 2001, and Dennis and Daniel moved to Tempe, Arizona to establish war or the white Aryan resistance in Arizona. And then another couple of years go by and the Arizona Republic is doing a story about Hispanic heritage celebration in Scottsdale. Now this started originally as an employee event and it got bigger and bigger and it was now including the whole, uh, all people of Scottsdale were invited to this Hispanic heritage celebration. And in this newspaper article, Don Logan was interviewed and he said, we're trying to educate the non-Hispanics on how broad the Hispanic, Hispanic culture is. Seemingly an innocuous statement, but this angered Dennis Mahone. And that evening that the paper had come out, a, 
a voicemail message was left on the Scottsdale Office of Diversity and Dialogue. And the message said, the white airing resistance is growing in Scottsdale. There are a few white people who are standing up. Now, the, when they got this message, they contacted the Scottsdale police and the Scottsdale police investigated. Our first poll is, according to Arizona law, the phone message, was it an actual threat? This is not what you think is, according to Arizona law, is that a threat? Your answer, of course, can be yes, no, or I don't know. And we, what we see is yes said 29%, no said 35%, and I don't know said 36%. Well, Scottsdale Police Department investigated. They found out that Daniel Mahone's phone was used, but it was Dennis who actually made the phone call. And based on this, they documented it, but they said it was no, it was not a threat. Five months after that, on February 26, 2004, let me show you the area that we're talking about because it's not exactly the same today as it was back then. You see Indian School Road up at the top, 75th Street coming down the middle of the road, Miller Road to the right, drink water to the left. This big complex is one civic center where a lot of city buildings, tax and license, et cetera, are there. That is City Hall. And that was at that time, the Human Resources Building. It's no longer the city, it's no longer owned by the city of Scottsdale. Let's take a look at it for a second. The building, as you see, had parking on the east side and covered parking on the south side. This large building was a training room. This building on the, on the west side was where you first came into the building. This was area was known as the West Wing. This is the South Wing. This is the East Wing. Just show you some other pictures from outside. It'll make sense in just a second. This is where you would walk in to actually put in an application back then for a job for the city of Scottsdale. It's showing you the orientation of what you're looking at down in that lower picture. And you see how you could just walk right in. There was no security, no, in, no anything. I'd also like to point on this picture looking straight at you're seeing the south wing right there and notice that fountain that fountain plays a little role in the story. So on this day. A package arrived through inner office mail to the mail room now I don't know if this is a, uh, the mail room or just a work room, but it was a room that was in this building and we're going to call it the mail room. So one of the human resources. Um, employees sees the package for Don and says, hey, Don, there's a package for you. Huh, it's from Arizona State Retirement. Do you think they're trying to tell you something? Ha, ha, ha. And one of the receptionists said, if there's a package for Don Logan, it's probably a bomb. Well, everyone laughed. Ha, 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 isn't that funny? Don walked over, took the package, and walked on over to his receptionist area. Now, this is not his exact receptionist area. I couldn't find a picture of beforehand. Um, but he put it on top of the desk, right about there, and he made the action of, like, I need scissors, because his assistant was on the phone talking to actually to another employee who was driving back from a meeting out of the city. And he said, I need scissors to open this package. And he turned the package first on the side and then on the back and he cut it open. That action most likely saved his life because the bomb was set to blow up, up and out and cut him from the top, essentially cut his body into two. But because it was pointed down at the time he opened it, instead when it blew up, it, po it shone down. And here's a picture of the area afterwards. You see there at number 47, that's where the bomb went into the wood with a particle board of that desk. Dawn's assistant was on the phone. She dropped the phone and that's where the phone lie right down there. Um, and when this photo was taken, this is exactly as it was, was seen. So you see there's again where the impact occurred. 
but some piece of shrapnel was able to fly across and hit that window to the right side. Here's another view of it. This whole window shattered. And this is Don's office in here. Now, interestingly, one of the things that Don thought was so strange about this package when he looked at it was it was addressed to Donald Logan and everyone called him Don. So he thought it was strange it was addressed to Donald. After the explosion, Don felt pain in his hand and there was smoke filled in the room. He staggered out and he came out to the fountain and a person came out of the training facility and had him lay down on the fountain approximately right there and tried to get him some different things, help him some water and some paper towel because Don was bleeding at that time. Another employee ran in and grabbed Don's assistant and led her out of the area because they didn't know if there was another one, they didn't know, they just need to get out of there at that point. Here's a picture to show the, the size of the impact. Again, you can, you can see here's this piece that was removed and this was just to show scale and here's the hand as well to show scale. A piece of shrapnel did come out and flew across and went into the wall and ripped the drywall. This is the address. I don't know if you can make it out because of the what this looks like, but it says to Donald Logan, Office of Diversity and Dialogue, City of Scottsdale City Hall, and gave the address not of City Hall, but of the mailroom, Scottsdale 85251. And what they didn't tell the public was inside the package, they found a note. And when they opened up the note, it said, Operation Archangel has determined you are engaged in unethical and corrupt activities which are detrimental to the security of the United States and the welfare of its citizens. You are ordered to immediately cease and desist all such activities. Sincerely, Edmund Burke. Now, I don't know if the name Edmund Burke means something to you. I had to look it up. Edmund Burke was an Anglo-Irish statesman who was alive in the 1800s and a philosopher, and he's considered the father of modern conservatism by people like Russell Kirk, William F. Buckley, Ronald Reagan, and Dr. Lee Edwards. The return address of the package said Arizona State Retirement System, and it actually had the correct address. And you'll notice that it has postage up on the top right. There was some debate whether this was interoffice or was it mailed? Did it get canceled? Whatever. And these are the parts that have remained from that package explosion. Don's assistant got a piece of shrapnel to the back of her eye and had to be surgically removed. And they, could, they were able to identify different bomb devices, uh, the battery right there. There's a, some fuse wire that was used. And here's another piece of the homemade shrapnel. When this went off, this bomb went off, uh, not only did the Scottsdale police respond, but also the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, or ATF, the U.S. Postal Inspection Service, and the FBI all came out to conduct this investigation. And they didn't know when this happened, if this was a dirty bomb, if there was nuclear material being used, so they brought out a bomb squad that came in with Geiger counters to check this out, not only to the Human Resources Building, but also to the hospital where Don was taken. And this is some of the video that came out that day. King News from 12 News. This is Richard Brewer in the Channel 12 Newsroom with a breaking news situation happening out in Scottsdale. According to a 911 report, there has been an explosion and one of the human resources... Scottsdale, two people have been injured after a package that was being opened at a city department exploded, and those two people were transported to a lot local. We believe hospital. from a 911 call that we heard about earlier that it may have been a package that was delivered there, but either way, the result the is the same. It was about the size of a notebook, a few inches thick at least. Police say that the man felt comfortable shook enough. Up and kind of nervous, are mobile, worried. They're conscious, they're just going to be treated, and uh, that's the good news. And that we're, we're investigating him. That explosion left him in serious condition.
with injuries to his hands well, and arms. I know that they weren't allowing any packages inside uh, the uh, city of Scottsdale offices, and they were encouraging people Tom not Logan, to open up Scottsdale's anything. Scottsdale's director of diversity and dialogue recovers from the blast. Considering he just got out of surgery about an hour ago, he's doing really well. The Valley. Other cities are taking extra precautions tonight to make sure their employees don't fall prey to any similar attack. Bomb-sniffing dogs checked out the mailroom in Glendale City Hall. The dogs are also sniffing mailrooms in Scottsdale, Phoenix, Mesa, and Tempe. Thank you to the Office of Communications who got that video for me. Don was taken to Scottsdale Memorial Osborne. Today it's called Honor Health Osborne. And he noticed a couple things right away. First off, some early reports show, showed pictures of him as if he had died. And here he is watching these um, from the hospital emergency room. And then he noticed that a lot of employees were staring at him and he didn't understand exactly why until finally one of the employees told him that the hospital staff who deal with emergencies all the time, they're a level one trauma center, had never seen someone who survived a bombing before. He was hospitalized for three days and required four surgeries to remove shrapnel from his arm and hand. He required a skin graft to regain the use of some of his fingers. And fortunately, no fingers had to be amputated. Police provided security to Don's home for months after the explosion. This is not Don's home. This is simply a Scottsdale police car in front of a, a restaurant, uh, just looking for a, a car from about that time. Don got out of the hospital and he returned to work and he participated in a press conference. He said he wasn't gonna let these cowards win. And he continued to work for almost five years before he decided to retire. You see that when he was doing that press conference, he still had some sort of splint device on his finger. Don's right hand did suffer permanent damage, but he can move it much better than what it looks like today. He said that for several years after the explosion, he wouldn't open any package sent to him. And I think that's pretty understandable. And the investigation quickly turned to these two, Dennis and Daniel Mahone. The Anti-Defamation League, which tracks the action of white supremacist groups, advised investigators that Dennis and Daniel Mahone lived in the area and they had connection to the Oklahoma City bombing. But after the bombing, the Mahone brothers moved out of Tempe into a mobile home park in Oklahoma. So for part of the investigation, they hired a confidential informant named Rebecca Williams, and she went undercover to try and um, get them to say something that they that would implicate them. After five years of undercover work, Dennis finally mentioned the exact length of the pipe bomb used at the Scottsdale bombing, and that was never released to the public. So Dennis and Daniel were arrested. They were actually back at their uh, family farm in Illinois when they were arrested on June 25th, 2009. And trial took place at the Sandra Day O'Connor U.S. Courthouse in downtown Phoenix. There's some interesting parts to the story of the court case. So I'm going to ask you for your input by launching a poll. So the first question, how many items of physical evidence do you think the prosecutors had against the Mahone brothers? And then the second question is, how many people of color were on the jury for the trial. Now, remember, we're not talking about a trial in the 40s, 50s, or 60s. We're talking about 2009. How many do you think were on? And the third question is, do you think the Mahone brothers could have been prosecuted for a hate crime? Do you think they were prosecuted for this hate crime? Was it a hate crime, in effect? Um, how about two more seconds? OK, looks like we've, we've hit it all. So. How much physical evidence do they have? 40% of you said less than 5,000 pieces of evidence. 30% said 5 to 10,000. 70% said 10 to 15,000. More than 20,000 said 13%. I will tell you the answer to this one. It's actually more than 20,000 pieces of physical evidence. How many people of color were on the jury when the trial started in 2009? Zero said 57% said zero, 17% said one, 26% said two, and no one said three. Interesting. And do you think the Mahone brothers could have been prosecuted for a hate crime? 79% said yes, 15% said no, and 6% said I don't know. 
Well, let's talk about this case and we'll see the answer to those last two. Rebecca Williams was called the trailer park Matahari by the defense. Uh, they were implying, of course, that she was the Dutch exotic dancer who was convicted of working as a spy for Germany in World War I. And she was in, uh, convicted in France. And that was the character of Mata Hari. And you see this, this is a picture of Mata Hari. And this is a uh, drawing. There's no pictures of Rebecca Williams for her own protection. The results of the trial were a little bit surprising. Uh, Daniel was not considered as aggressive as Dennis. Dennis was definitely more of the leader of the two. Daniel Mahone was only charged with one count of conspiracy to damage buildings and property, and uh, he was found not guilty. Whereas Dennis was charged with four crimes, conspiracy to damage buildings and property by means of explosion, malicious damage to buildings by means of explosion, distribution of information related to explosion, and a hate crime. He was found guilty of three of the four. The one he was not found guilty of was the hate crime, believe it or not. And also interesting, although this was 2009, not one person of color was on this jury. Dennis appealed this all the way to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal, saying that federal charges couldn't be done because this happened in a city and the city was not involved in interstate commerce that was required. The Ninth Cir Circuit Court of Appeal struck it down saying Scottsdale was involved in interstate commerce as a tourist destination. The investigation discovery show did a TV, ch did a show called Evil Twins and they did one of the episode on the Mahones, episode five called Tribe of Two. It came out in 2013. One little funny thing note of, if you watch this, if you have a subscription to to a cable service or to um, satellite TV, you can watch this by entering in your user information. Uh, in the actors that they use the, for this, once the Mahone brothers become adults, the actors never change, even though they were actually like 60 years old at the time they were arrested, they still appear to be the 30 year old versions of themselves. There's ongoing consequences. Whenever an explosion happens anywhere, the only person that they have that can has survived this at the turn to interview is Don Logan. This is a photo from 2006. Where are they now? Well, Don Logan retired from the city of Scottsdale in November 2007. And then he was brought back in 2008 to be the diversity administrator for the city of Glendale on the west side from 2008 to 2012. In 2015, he was hired to be the director of equal opportunity department for the city of Phoenix. And when I got to talk to him about this, it was in his office and he actually had a view from his office of the Sandra Day O'Connor building where the trial took place from his office. Don wrote a book about this case. It's called Targeted Delivery, Destination Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, interesting book tell. It's actually written before it, it came out in 2007, so before the trial took place. So there's no ending yet to the story. Um, if you're interested in reading it, my favorite part was actually I had already known the story, so I enjoyed re reading him coming up through the ranks of the city of Scottsdale. He talks quite a bit about that. But when I went to buy this book, I looked on Amazon. If you want the Kindle version, it was $7.99. But if you wanted a paper copy, it was $199. And I told Don that, and he said, oh, just tell people go to my website, Don Logan and Associates, and there you can buy a copy for $14.99. And if you ask him, he'll sign it for you. Rebecca Williams lives in an undisclosed location in the Southwestern United States. Uh, they don't really talk about her, but in the, in the, uh, the story on the um, evil twins, Rebecca shows up at the trial in disguise and introduces herself to Don. Daniel Mahone returned to the family farm in Illinois. There's a Google Earth shot of his family farm. Dennis Mahone was found guilty, of course, and he was sentenced to 40 years at FCI Federal Correctional Institute in Terre Haute, Indiana. This one picture I have of him was from taken in 2014. His sentence will be concluded 
will be completed at the year 2052 when he'll be 102 years of age and there is no parole for federal charges. Here's a picture of the prison he's at. And interestingly, this is the same prison that they held Timothy McVeigh before he was executed for his crimes of the Oklahoma City bombing. We're gonna go into the next story, a little bit lighter topic or, or no, that's not true. Both of them are pretty heavy topics. This one is called, It All Started in Scottsdale. And those of you who've seen me before, you know I sometimes go on tangents. So this time I planned the tangent so I wouldn't go on too long. Whenever there's a couple that commits bank robberies, they're always called the modern day Bonnie and Clyde or the Bonnie and Clyde of fill in the location. Now we think of Bonnie and Clyde for some reason of this romantic thing that they fought back or they were outsiders, but I don't think that people really realized that they were responsible for a two year crime spree of auto thefts, armed robberies, bank robberies, kidnappings, murder, and murder of nine different police officers. We get our popularity of them from this movie, Bonnie and Clyde, by, that starred Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway. But actually at the time, um, Bonnie and Clyde became kind of, well, actually Bonnie became a sex symbol. And here's actually the story behind it. On April 13, 1933 in Joplin, Missouri, police raided what they thought were bootleggers living in an apartment over a garage, but it was actually the Clyde Barrow gang. And they got into a shootout, two police officers were killed, one was critically injured and the gang all escaped, but all their belongings were left behind. And Bonnie had a camera with a roll of film and the newspaper got a hold of those pictures and they published them. And that's led to a lot of their fame because Bonnie became a sex symbol. This first one is the second most risque photo of 1933, 32. I'm showing Bonnie holding a gun with a cigar in her mouth. Very unladylike, very uh, risque for its day. But the most risque for its day was this photo of Bonnie supposedly disarming Clyde and reaching into his midsection. And that was considered so risque that some newspapers wouldn't publish this photo. And Bonnie became a media superstar, a sex symbol for this picture. Now you can compare these actions to the subjects in our story, but I think what you're gonna find is that neither one of them is any sort of sex symbol or, or romantic life. This is a very, both of these, both Bonnie and Clyde and the story we're gonna talk about today are kind of sad. One little interesting thing, if you look on the bottom right-hand corner, J. Edgar Hoover put out their wanted poster issued back in 1932. Let's go back to our story. We're talking about Scottsdale in 1997, about 20% smaller than it is today population-wise, almost the same size geographically. The mayor is Sam Campana. And the backstory concerns Craig Michael Pritchard, who grew up in Scottsdale and attended Coronado High School. And at high school, he was, he was like big man on campus. He was the superstar. He was the great baseball player. Here he is in the Coronado High School yearbook photo. Here's another picture of him. Um, he was a superstar. Everyone knew that high school wasn't going to be the end of his career in baseball. He was going on bigger and better. He was also on the football team, but in his senior year, he was only playing baseball. His girlfriend was a cheerleader. She was elected to the homecoming queen in 1979. Definitely, they were the, uh, the couple at Coronado High School. After graduating high school for a couple of years, I couldn't really find a lot of signs of him. And then finally I found out that I knew he was at Scottsdale Community College. And how did I know that? Well, it turns out he got cited for expired registration exceeding um, and speeding in 1982. And it says right there that he's a student at Scottsdale Community College. In 1983, he was able to attend ASU and he played on the baseball team. And his batting average wasn't that great. He did, you know, he batted 157. He had seven runs, three RBIs. He struck out 10 times. 
but he ran into a force in the same, he played outfield and there was another outfielder who was just doing so much better than him and he really couldn't compete. That guy happened to be, you ready for this? Barry Bonds. Barry Bonds in his first year at Arizona State University was just so much better than Craig. And Bonds played for ASU from 1983 to 1985 and he was clearly a superstar just waiting to be to become that. However, he was one of the least popular players on the team. The coach, Jim Brock, said he was considered rude, inconsiderate, and self-centered. He bragged about the money he turned down, and he popped off about his dad. I don't think he ever figured out what to do to make people like him. And at one point, Bonds was voted off the team by his teammates. So Craig was out from ASU and he got a job selling solar heating panels. He got married and his wife started to work at a bank and he became fascinated with all things to do with banking. It became a passion for him. He applied himself to learning about banks as he once applied himself to baseball. By early 1990, his marriage was crumbling. He had a few children. Um, he was estranged from them. March of 1990, his wife filed for divorce. By August, the divorce was finalized. So Craig decided for a new line. He decided to go into bank robbery. And he attempted some bank robberies in Phoenix, Las Vegas, and Honolulu, and he was caught. When he was taken and put into to jail for six years, instead of spending the time trying to change his life around, he took the time to get an education how to be a better bank robber. He found all the bank robbers he could and asked for them for their help in becoming a better bank robber. Well, by the time he got out of prison, he was much better, much more proficient with bank robbery skills. By 1997, he was out of prison, divorced, estranged from his children, and a convicted felon. At this point, he came up with the plan. Here's what the plan was supposed to look like. The area we're talking about is what now would be called Sky Song, but back then it was called Los Arcos Mall. This is McDowell Road up at the top. This is Scottsdale Road, 74th Street, and Miller Road. Please notice the LA Fitness on the right side, Los Arcos Mall, and up at the top, Norwest Bank. These all play a role in this story. So here was the plan. Car number one gets placed over in front of LA Fitness. Car number two is placed over by Norwest Bank. He goes back to car number one, where Craig starts the car on fire. Once it gets going to a nice burn, he then goes around, walks carefully over to the bank, and walks into the bank, where he's now wearing a stocking over his head and rubber gloves. He does his armed robbery. He has a backpack with him. And while police and fire go to deal with the burning fire or burning car, Craig walks out of the bank, gets into car number two, where he drives away. That's how the plan was supposed to, to work. It was supposed to be so easy, but there was a major flaw that he had no idea that a month before this, the bank called Norwest Bank started using a brand new robbery prevention device, device called an ETS. This is sort of, I took a picture of Craig and I put a uh, blue hat and with red letters, that's what it was described. He was wearing, of course, he would have had a stocking over his face so you couldn't recognize him. But this ETS device was placed into the money somehow. And when he walked out with the backpack, they could track him from that moment, both from a helicopter and if someone had a scanner, if an officer or detective had a scanner, they could scan him both ways. So as Craig was driving down north on Scottsdale Road, a police helicopter started circling around him and then the police came behind him. So he went down Camelback Road and he drove into Fashion Square Mall's brown garage where the helicopter and the police set up a perimeter and were now looking for him. So they had the description of him wearing a white shirt and blue pants. So he was looking 
like this. This is a model. This is not Craig, but essentially white shirt and blue pants. He got out of the car and most people would probably just throw up their hands, but Craig just had this survival incident and he's, he's a very smart guy. So here's what he did. He walked into the mall and walked over to the team shop. And once he's in the team shop, he bought a green um, Phoenix Coyotes. They weren't called the Arizona Coyotes yet. They were still called the Phoenix Coyotes. He bought a polo shirt and he put that on and we went to pay for it. He pulled out three $20 bills that were wet, damp from his pocket, not, not from in a wallet. And the reason was he thought if he, if they were sent, if they were um, having some sort of device, he would just put all the money in water and that would deactivate the device. And he didn't realize the ETS didn't work that way. Once he got that, he decided to be even cleverer and he walked over to Nordstrom's where he purchased what was described as a short sleeve Hawaiian shirt, Hawaiian shorts and Jesus sandals was the description. He paid $200 in cash for the clothing with more wet money. And this was later obtained, but this was three hours after this time. So he was now looking like this, where he walked out of the mall. The police are in the corners waiting for someone to come out with white shirt and blue pants. And here he walks out across the street and goes to a, a restaurant called Eli's. He stayed there, he ordered a couple drinks. He used the phone, he called his living girlfriend, told her that he's breaking up with her and he's not going to see her again. And he left all of his stuff there. Well, when the police eventually got to that, um, that apartment they were living in, this girlfriend couldn't cooperate enough. She was not pleased with Craig. When it's time to go, Craig waited for three guys to be walking out and he walked out with them as if he was part of the group. And when they turned in the parking lot to go to the car, he ran in the direction of the safari resort to get away. He was not caught. So the investigation began at that point. The burnout car from the fire at 7529 East McDowell didn't have a license plate, but it did have a surviving VIN. And in that VIN showed it was registered to Craig Pritchard's father, a clue that Craig may have been involved in some way. The white car that had the tracking device, that, uh, that's a picture of his Dodge Stratus from the Scottsdale Police photograph from it getting processed. This had the tracking device in it. This vehicle had a license plate and was registered to Craig Pritchard. Inside, they found uh, a Radio Shack police scanner that was set to Scottsdale Police radio frequencies. When they opened up the door, they found some items such as the backpack that was used by the suspect, van shoes worn by the suspect, the white shirt that the suspect had on, and cash from the robbery. When they opened up the backpack, they found the stocking that was used to hide the suspect's face, the, rubber, the cash from the bank robbery, and rubber gloves used by the suspect. But the ultimate was inside the backpack, they found a wallet. And in that wallet, was the social security card of Craig Pritchard, the Sam's Club membership with photograph of Craig Pritchard and the driver's license of Craig Pritchard. The case was assigned to Detective Tom Van Meter, badge number 292. And Tom is, was a legend in the Scottsdale Police because not only was he an amazing armed robbery, bank robbery detective, but he had almost a near photographic memory of pictures of people's faces. And if he was searching for some guy from a bank robbery, he would work off duty at Fashion Square Mall. And think about it, if you're living in the Valley and suddenly you have $20,000 you wanna blow, where better to go and spend some money than Fashion Square Mall? Tom arrested more bank robbers from Fashion Square Mall than probably anybody else before or since that time. While hiding out in New Mexico, um, he met Nova Pritchard and Nova, I'm sorry, Nova Guthrie. And Nova was 12 years younger than Craig, but she became quite infatuated with him. She was living in Farmington, New Mexico, uh, where Pritchard was hiding out. And at first he wouldn't tell Nova what he's doing. He would just go away for uh, a while at a time. And he met, made up or he, re, he reunited with 
a guy named Nate. Nate was in prison with him at the same time. And he was the second guy at the beginning of their bank robberies. So Pritch and Nate got really elaborate with their bank robberies. They wore disguises. They did takedown robberies where they would order everyone to the ground. They would use duct tape, zip ties to restrain witnesses. They emptied the vault. He did robberies with a... Um, when Craig was interviewed later, he said, my favorite words of encouragement to the bank tellers were, move it, blankety blank. I won't use the swear words. This is a sprint, not a marathon. And he said that these words were screamed vehemently. He said, I believe it was important to visualize myself shooting someone in the face. I did this throughout the bank robbery. If someone looked at me in the eye, it was a challenge to me. And what they saw was disturbing. Interestingly, he never did shoot anybody. He also got elaborate with his countermeasures. Now knowing that the, the bucket of water wasn't going to work, he wired up a microwave oven into his car when he was committing bank robberies. So he'd throw, he'd microwave the money to kill or to defeat any ETS, um, electronic ETS. And he began a, a bank robbery, cross country, multi state. Um, series of bank robberies. So this first one he starts off, of course, he did Scottsdale, $32,000 he got on August 12th. Then he goes up to Peak National Bank in Conifer, Colorado, where he got $34,000. That was only about 12 days after, I'm sorry, eight days after the Scottsdale bank robbery. Then just Maybe two weeks after that, he goes back to the exact same bank and this time gets $101,000. And this time he's with a second person for these two robberies in Colorado. Then he goes over to Durango, Colorado, where he gets $64,000 at the Bank of the Southwest. This is October 31st, 1997. And now Nova is in on it, unbeknownst to most people, as they go and they hit on um, January 26, 1998, they go to Missoula, Montana. It's up here up on the map, where they get $34,000 from that bank. And this is just Nova as driving the car and Craig in the bank. And then they go down to Aztec, New Mexico, where they get $47,000. They go back into Colorado on March 20th, 1998, but something happens and the, the walkie-talkie between he and Nova is not working, so he stops in the middle and it's only an attempt, it never became a bank robbery. On April 21st, he goes to Colorado Springs National Bank in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and gets $146,000, his biggest bank robbery of all the series. A few months later, September 10th, he goes back to Colorado Springs and gets $126,000, the second largest. And then on November 19th, he goes to the Guaranteed Federal Bank in Dickerson, Texas, where they get $72,000. Then they moved back to the good old Peak National Bank in Conifer, Colorado, the third time that poor bank got the same, were robbed by the same people. And finally, for this time, February 19, 1999, um, Klamath First Federal Bank in Bend, Oregon, they get $120,000. Then there's a total break in the case just the next month. On March 2nd, Nova Guthrie first goes in to Phoenix, she's visiting with her family and her sister decides to, talks her into turning herself in. They also told her to break up with Craig Pritchard. And her brother-in-law told Craig essentially to get out of their house and not to come back, that Nova was done with him. She did go up to Denver where she talked to a family friend who was a police chaplain and they um, went into the FBI in Denver where she turned herself in, she explained the whole thing. The FBI had no idea she played any part in the story at this point. And they were trying to verify everything when Craig found her and they went off again. And it wasn't like she was detained or she just, they were waiting to, to verify all the stuff. But until that moment, 
the FBI had no idea she was part of this. They just thought Craig was doing all the bank robberies. But when she was there, she did tell them some things that, for example, in the middle of the crime series, um, after the New Mexico bank robbery on March 17, 1998, they went to Washington and then finally in Canada, where they did some skiing in British Columbia at some exclusive ski resorts. Then Craig decided he wanted to see if they could get to Mexico. So Nova went first and she flew to Cancun, Mexico. She, once she arrived safely, Craig followed her there and they stayed there for a number of weeks. And then she decided to go to Belize and they traveled there and they stayed at some very nice resorts there. And after that, they decided to, to go into Texas. So at least they now knew where, why there were so many months in between some of these bank robberies, what they were traveling, what they were doing. Once they came back and they're now back together, reunited, they start some more bank robberies. So on April 1st, 1999, they go to Mesa, Arizona, and they get the first international bank and trust on Main Street. They got $45,000. Then they went to the, um, back to Dixon, Texas, and they got the Guaranteed Federal Bank again for $72,000. There's a seventh month gap in between these two robberies from the one in Mesa to the one in Texas. But at that point, that was the end of the robbery. They made during that time a grand total $943,000, just under a million dollars. Now they did not walk away with that much money because of course the first three or four that he had to split with Nate and then after that, they've been living the high life, staying at these fancy resorts and hotels and um, skiing and scuba diving, whatever else they did. But they estimated that they still had about $300,000 or more when the bank robbery stopped. The last bank robbery, November 19th, they never saw another bank robbery by Pritchett and Guthrie. So how are you gonna find them? They put up wanted posters just like they did for Bonnie and Clyde, they did it for Craig Pritchard and Nova Guthrie, every post office in the United States. There was a story about them on Unsolved Mysteries. There was a story about them on America's Most Wanted. It was episode 45 and it aired on March 16, 2002. They were featured in, in the show 2020 with Hugh Downs of Barbara Walters. But all these different things, sometimes it just takes one person at the right place at the wrong time to solve this case. And this case, it was a lady, this is four years after the last bank robbery, a, a woman from Cape Town, South Africa was in the US and she went into a post office and she saw a wanted poster and recognized Andy Brown, the manager of the Bossa Nova bar in Cape Town, South Africa, as listed as Nova Guthrie. She called the police at 10 p.m. and it led to their arrest. Craig later said the reason that they had picked South Africa was it was an English speaking country that didn't broadcast America's Most Wanted. He thought of it that far. So they got arrested and they were extradited back to the United States. And in a, a wonderful moment of honor among thieves, Nate was offered that if he would process if he would aid in prosecution by testifying against Craig, he would not get prosecuted, so he chose that. Nova pled guilty to three counts, and Craig pled guilty to all the counts, and therefore he, Nate, was not needed to testify against him. He could have been sentenced to 80 years. He was sentenced on June 15, 2004. He took a plea deal of 20 years just for the Scottsdale bank robbery. There's a TV show on a &E Network that was broadcast on June 3rd, 2010 called Fugitive Chronicles. And their episode nine of their first season was called Pritchard. And the series examined life on the run. And they took some photos and they interviewed some of the different detectives who were involved as they tried to, to say how they searched for them for four years. And here's a picture of the actors. I always thought that the, the guy that played Craig looked more like Jim Carrey and the woman who's obviously supposed to be wearing a wig looks more like Julia Roberts, but okay. I did try and find a copy of this and the only way I could find it was in Australia on the PAL format, which was worthless to me. I have not been able to find it available 
in any streaming service. Apparently movie producers called asking for the movie rights to Craig Pritchard's life. Um, they also wanted to, to interview him on 2020, Dateline, E! Entertainment Television, Access Hollywood, and many, many more. But that was the end of Craig's story at that point. So now let's go into where are they now? Scottsdale detective Tom Van Meter was a very successful detective who finally retired in 2010, and he was hired by Fashion Square Mall to be their head of security for five years. He retired from that in 2015 and now um, is completely retired, although he did tell me that he gets calls asking him to work cold cases and to teach classes on bank robbery. He always wants to mention Craig Pritchard as one of the major points of this class because he said he's the best bank robber I've ever seen. And this man saw many, many bank robbers. In honor of Tom, the Scottsdale Police Department called an activation of an ETS a 292 after his badge number. That particular radio code was retired when ETSs were no longer used by the banking industry. Nate was never prosecuted from bank robberies and apparently he's now a contractor in some community somewhere not in Arizona. Nova Guthrie served her sentence of 10 years and she was released in 2012. But in the first six months, she was thrown into solitary confinement where the only thing she had was a book on um, yoga. And she became very, she became very good at doing yoga. And after she got out of solitary confinement, she found there was a program called Yoga Behind Bars. And she became first a student of the program and eventually an instructor. When she was released in 2014, she became a yoga instructor in Richmond, Washington. That's Washington State, not DC. And she currently works for a company in that area. And I found a, I'll show you a picture in just a second. Before I tell you that, uh, America's Most Wanted has aided in the prosecution of 1,203 fugitives. But of those 1,203, only three have turned their lives around to lead productive lives. Nova Guthrie is one of those three people. And like, if you look at the America Most Wanted fan sites, you'll see she is one of the three people mentioned as someone who's turned their life around. There's a picture of what Nova looks like today, or at least recently. One of the, um, one of the FBI agents said that, and also Tom said, that had Nova not met Craig, she would have had a nice normal life. And as long as Craig's not in her life, she will continue a normal life. He was convinced of that. Now let's talk about Craig. He's serving a 20 year prison sentence. He's in the Federal Correctional Institute of Safford, Arizona. And he's scheduled to be released on October 23rd, 2022. That's in two years from today, approximately, or just less than two years. Tom Van Meter predicted that Pritchard would be quiet for six months after being released from prison, but then would go back to bank robberies. And just in case you're not aware, there's Safford, Arizona, where it's located. So how does this compare? Some people will say, well, Craig and, and Nova never shot anybody. They never harmed anybody. But at the same time, I'll tell you that Craig that they've interviewed people that Craig and Nova did these bank robberies for, and they've they got out of the banking industry. They were sickened by it. They they felt terrible. They never they never want to walk into banks again. They definitely traumatize people. So my feeling is that neither one of these, um, neither Bonnie and Clyde nor Craig and Nova, really are a anything to be emulated. That's a, a synopsis of Bonnie and Clyde, two-year crime speed. They both had two years. Um, Bonnie and Clyde did auto thefts. They robbed convenience stores, bank robberies, kidnappings, killed four people, killed nine police officers. Um, Nova and Craig, same two years. No auto thefts, no convenience stores, 14 banks robbed, zero kidnappings, zero civilians killed, zero police officers killed. Some other things really quickly. That's the end for now. I want to thank some of these people who helped me with this story, uh, all the people in my department at the library, the Office of Communications who helped me with those videos, uh, Don Logan with the Office of Diversity, 
and different people from the Scottsdale Police Department, and of course, our treasurer of the Scottsdale historian, Joan Fadala, who helped me. And if you have any questions, that's how to reach me. I, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you uh, had a good time and a good afternoon. And thank you all very much for coming to Scottsdale's Neighborhood College final presentation, Stories from the Files of the Scottsdale Police Department.